So today we are honored to have uh, Dr. Eric Wong uh, to speak to us about the topic of dementia. Uh, so Dr. Eric Wong is a clinical associate for geriatric medicine uh, at St. Michael's Hospital and University Health Network. Um, he's also a PhD candidate for clinical epidemiology and healthcare research and an Elliott Peterson clinician scientist at the University of Toronto. He's a 2019 recipient of the Vanier Scholarship in the research area of geriatrics. Um, welcome, Dr. Wong, and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Kenneth. Um, so uh, I'm going to start now. If there's any audio problems, uh, Kenneth, you let me know. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a geriatrician. I usually work at St. Michael's Hospital. Um, for the uh, next few months, I'm at Care First, uh, substituting for Dr. Grace uh, Leung's uh, parental leave. So this is actually her presentation. I made some changes, but I thank her for letting me use her slides. We'll go through uh, some of these items today. Um, basically an overview of what dementia is. The, uh, the talk is intended for a general audience, but I'll go into some specifics. Um, and of course, if there are questions at the end, I'm happy to entertain them. Dementia is a very common disease. And so uh, the prevalence, the frequency of which we see this disease increases with age. Uh, by the time somebody is, is in their 80s, there's about one in three chance of having the disease. And um, every year in Canada, there are 25,000 new cases. Overall, um, the number of people with dementia is increasing. And this is because uh, the population is aging um, due to the baby boomers. And so uh, we're expecting to see more cases every year. But as a proportion of all the people of a certain age group, uh, the uh, relative um, uh, incidence of dementia is actually decreasing because of better education. So we know that um, when you're young, if you have better education, uh, you tend to have a lower risk of developing dementia. What's happened in the last several decades since the Second World War is uh, people have been living longer, but not only that, they've had better education. Uh, you know, now it's very common to see young people with like, you know, a degree or several university degrees. So we know that that education when you're younger is protective for dementia. One in five Canadians have experienced caring for someone with dementia. So this is a very important point because um, a, a lot of times how we encounter this disease is by caring for somebody with it as a caregiver. And we um, are seeing that a lot uh, lately in the news because of COVID-19. There's been a lot of news about how caregivers cannot see their um, family members with dementia in nursing homes or other facilities. And so caregivers are a very important part uh, of the spectrum of management for dementia. Um, we, uh, the, the, the community as a whole, like Care First, provides a lot of assistance and programs, but at the end of the day, the bulk of the work, um, caring for someone with dementia, falls on caregivers. And so this may be a paid caregiver, somebody uh, who is hired, somebody who's uh, hired by the CCAC or the LIN, or it can be a community agency like uh, Care First, or uh, it could be somebody who is uh, what used to be called an informal caregiver or a family caregiver, some, a part of your family who's doing that work. So we'll talk a little bit about normal aging versus dementia. Uh, this is a question that comes up very often in clinic. A lot of people will ask, you know, what is normal and what is not? As we get older, um, our memory and our brains change, just like all the other organs in our body. Uh, but dementia is very different than the typical changes to memory that you may experience with aging. Um, so for example, here, the first item, uh, occasionally forgetting a name or a date. That, that can be quite normal. You know, we, we all do that. Actually, even you know, when we're younger, depending on how much sleep you get, uh, whether you're preoccupied with something else on your mind, like you're worried about something, um, or you're very busy. So occasionally forgetting something like a name or a date is not a big deal. But if you forget uh, dates and names on a regular basis, persistently, 
day after day, week after week, month after month, that's not normal, right? So a once in a while thing that's isolated versus a consistent pattern is a very different issue. Um, not being able to remember the name of an acquaintance, like a friend, family member. Uh, I like to say that, you know, if, if the friend or family member you haven't seen in a long time and you have trouble recalling their names, that's very normal. But if it's somebody in your immediate family, like you cannot remember the name of your own children who are living with you, that's a very different problem. That's not expected with aging. So some things that are abnormal on the right side, normal on the left side. Some more examples. Uh, as people get older, they may have occasional difficulty finding words, just taking a little longer time to get to the words. That's okay. Um, but there's an issue when you're not only not finding the right words, but you're taking a very long time. Uh, and also you may be using the wrong word to substitute. And so uh, those issues are, they're less common. You, you know, it's less common in presenting issue with uh, dementia. There's a specific group of dementias called the primary progressive aphasias or language dementias that feature this symptom, but uh, it certainly it will happen. And um, if you know someone with dementia and you follow them along their course, later in the disease, that ha this happens to everybody with dementia. They all uh, lose the ability to form language. And so language is a, you know, there's lots of worth mentioning since Care First, uh, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, Chinese speaking um, patients who use it. You know, you, you tend to lose uh, your second language first and you tend to retain your native tongue until the end. Um, but, you know, you basically are regressing, you're kind of going back in time and unlearning the things that you learn later on. Uh, so the second point here is losing things and retracing your steps to find them. Um, misplacing things is a very, very common issue, right? I think a lot of you will know family members or yourself uh, who will misplace things. And then if you're able to sort of retrace your steps, go back and, and find them, um, that's okay. But if you're losing things, you have no way of finding them. And then you ask someone to help you and they find it, you know, pretty quickly, then that you know, that may indicate a problem as well. So we know that with the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, people often have short-term memory issues, meaning that if you put something down and then you distract yourself by doing something else, you may not remember where you put that thing down. And that's why we're talking about just misplacing things. But of course, misplacing things is, as I said, very common and it may not always be a sign of dementia. It's basically not just one issue, but rather a pattern of issues that tell us whether someone has dementia. A few other examples that I have here that uh, may be helpful. So um, if you have difficulty navigating unfamiliar environments, you've never been to this small town before, decided to take a drive there for, you know, because you can't, you can't travel anymore, uh, anywhere because of COVID. So you decide to take a, you know, a driving trip to some parts of Ontario, beautiful places. And you know you're unfamiliar. You get you have difficulty navigating uh, without a GPS or or a map. Then that's okay, right? You know you're not familiar with it. It's okay to get lost. But if you have difficulty navigating your own neighborhood, you know where you grew up, where you lived for 30, 40 years, that's not normal, right? You should not be getting lost in your own neighborhood. Or uh, when people get worse in dementia, they may have trouble navigating a restaurant. So, uh, you know, uh, not, it's not uncommon. I would see some patients, uh, you know, certain restaurants, especially dim sum places, Chinese restaurants, uh, the bigger ones, uh, you know, you, you hear that, oh, they're having trouble finding the bathroom and coming back. And you ask them, well, how, how often have you been to that restaurant? And they say, well, you know, you know I go there every week you know, for the last 10 years. That's a problem because you should know the, the layout of that restaurant inside out. Your brain will learn it. You don't have to specifically learn it but your brain will learn it through repetition. And so if you unlearn that, if you have trouble navigating a restaurant uh, that, that you're familiar with, that, that's a serious problem. It is a sign of something that's changing in the brain that's beyond normal. Second item here is unable to manage finances because spouse who managed them uh, moved to a nursing home or passed away. Another very common 
uh, thing we see um, about finances. So finances, meaning your bank accounts, your bill payments or taxes, uh, that's considered a high level activity of daily living or an instrumental activity of daily living, something that is a, is a high level activity that you do to organize your life. And so these are challenging. Now, if uh, you've never done taxes, never done bill payments, they've always been done by somebody else and you can't do them now, that's fine. You know, you're not changing. It's just who you were. You never learned a skill. But if you were an accountant and your entire career, you've been helping people do taxes and business management or like financial management. And then over the last year or two, you stopped doing your own taxes. You can no longer manage to do your own taxes or you're making errors with your own taxes and bill payments, then that's a concern. So I'm giving you some, you know, some more extreme examples, but they're, they're in, indicative of something that is out of the ordinary, right? So somebody who's very familiar, who's always done their taxes, bill payments, on time, no errors, all of a sudden in the last year or two starts having difficulty, that's not a normal change, right? There's something else going there. So now you have to think like, well, maybe it's because they're physically quite ill. They're unable to use a computer or, you know, because of arthritis or they can't walk to the bank. So the physical issues is a separate problem. But, you know, if they're physically well, but they're uh, mentally unwell, they're unable to do it, then that's, um, that could be a problem. The third item is um, unable to prepare meals because uh, of physical limitations. So, so uh, meal preparation is the third thing that we're going to talk about. The reason I talk about this is because um, the uh, older adults, uh, they may come from a generation where uh, w women may not have done a lot of the finances. They may not be driving, which is another advanced uh, activity of daily living. But they're, you know, most certainly very good with meal preparation. They cook very elaborate meals and know how to make really complicated recipes. Now, if somebody who is able to do that uh, is unable to prepare those meals anymore in the last you know, couple of years, one or two years, then something has changed. Now, again, just like the finances, it can be due to physical issues. Maybe your arm has arthritis, you can no longer cook, maybe you can no longer stand very well because of knee arthritis or degenerative changes in your back. Um, but you know, if you're physically okay, but you just are unable to bake that cake that you usually make for Christmas, or you're unable to prepare that chicken, turkey that you're you've done for the last you know six, seven decades of your life, that's a problem, right? That that's there's something different about that. Um, and so we know that with meal preparation with cooking, it's actually very complicated if you think about. Uh, how it's done. You obviously learn it through time and, you know, from, from a young age and some people, um, but it requires a lot of organizational abilities in the brain. You need to sequence your events, you need to plan for what you're going to make, go to the grocery store, get the ingredients, make sure you have all of them, and then you have to plan out how you're going to sequence uh, those things. So when I'm asking these questions to patients, I, I will, you know, I, I will probe a little bit about, so what, you know, what do you cook? Like, what do you like to cook? If you just like do toast and that's all you've done your whole life, it's not very complicated. But, you know, if you, you know, made very elaborate meals for like, like you know, a family of like eight or 10, um, then you've been able to do that for your entire life and now you're not, then there may be something different. Um, of course, this question about cooking abilities is also a little bit complicated, especially with Asian cultures, uh, but also like I think all sorts of different cultures have the same thing where uh, children are sometimes very loving and as uh, they get older, it's just naturally uh, the children or the, um, uh, the children basically take over and, and do all the cooking. And it's not that, you know, you're not able to do it, but it's just that the children are very loving and they take over. That makes things difficult. So we can't really assess well, is it because you can't do it? Um, but I think that a lot of older adults like to maintain their independence. So even if there are children around who help them, um, if they had the ability to do so, they would definitely try to cook. So just some observations and some patterns that we look for. All right, so some warning signs that, you know, dementia may be on the horizon. Uh, if somebody uh, is uh, neglecting their personal hygiene, so uh, being unkempt, 
uh, when they were, you know, they were perfectly groomed, say five years ago, no issues with like the cleanliness of their clothing, of their apartment, of their home. And suddenly over the last few years, there's been a change. Every time you see them, they appear that they haven't bathed or showered in a while and their clothes are dirty and their home is uh, dirty and uh, cluttered, then that's an issue. Uh, decreasing or stop activity participation is another one of those things. Uh, you know, you're used to going to a group, uh, whether it's um, like gatherings, uh, programs, uh, swimming groups, and then you suddenly start stop going to them. Um, forgetting things on a daily basis, as I said before, this recurrent pattern of forgetfulness, that's not a once in a while thing. Uh, making unusual purchases. Now, uh, we do see this once in a while where um, uh, people mismanage their finances, very challenging situation, um, especially for people who may have a lot of finances, uh, or maybe have a lot of, uh, you know, accounts and assets, and then they may lose the ability to make sound financial decisions, which will lead to loss of those assets. And so that's a very tricky situation. Um, medically, like we can only tell you what's going on, which is, yeah, I think that their brain and memory and cognition are, are not what it used to be. And so somebody needs to take over and, and make sure that they're uh, managing those finances properly, but it can be a sign that something's different. Um, exhibiting unusual behaviors. Uh, so uh, this uh, gets into something called with uh, more frontal, what we call frontal symptoms, meaning issues with the front part of the brain. And so the front part of your brain um, uh, controls stuff like inhibition, like it's being socially appropriate. Uh, what's socially appropriate? When is it socially appropriate to to go to the bathroom, not in the middle of the house, right? You have to use the to, to the washroom. And so if people are not doing that, then that can be an issue. Um, and, and other, you know, socially inappropriate things that people may do, unusual behaviors. Um, good, so it's morning signs. So what is dementia? We've actually talked a lot about some of the symptoms that you may recognize before. Uh, those are the presentations of the dementia, but what is it actually? And so dementia is not one disease. It's actually a group of different diseases uh, that happen when parts of the brain die off. Now, um, usually with dementia, the, the brain dies off in time, gradually, because of an abnormal accumulation of a protein. So the most classic one is Alzheimer's disease, and you may have all heard about Alzheimer's. It's the most common form of dementia. And so that, in that disease, it's because the brain accumulates amyloid. Amyloid is a type of abnormal protein in the body. And when the brain accumulates that, basically uh, the, the brain cells die because it's toxic to the brain cells. And so as that part of the brain dies off, you gradually lose the ability that are controlled by that part. In Alzheimer's disease, the first part that goes is the hippocampus, uh, which is the memory center. It's when you learn new memory, you encode them, and then you put them into the uh, cortex of your brain. So um, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease, the short-term memory goes first, meaning stuff like uh, orientation to the date because you have to refresh the date every day in, in your head, so it's short-term memory, uh, or, or repeating stuff again and again, like you know, you ask a question, you got answered, and then you forget that answer right away, uh, short-term memory issues. Um, dementia requires a decline in at least one cognitive domain, so uh, it's a little bit more complicated here. We're not gonna go through this because this is, uh, you know, I think beyond the scope of the talk, but in your brain, you have different domains, uh, meaning different abilities that we classify. Um, and so one is memory, which is only one part. Then you have the visual spatial, meaning seeing things in space, uh, language, as we talked about your language abilities, and then attention, I mean, how well do you focus on your conversations or on the things that you do, you're doing, executive function, is uh, executive function is for controlling higher level, higher order uh, functions in the brain. And so dementia requires you to have a problem with at least one of these things. It doesn't always have to be memory, but most commonly it is memory. And uh, that decline interferes with your daily function, uh, meaning that you can no longer cope, you can no longer drive, you can no longer do finances. And, um, the disease is progressive, meaning that it doesn't, it, it doesn't, get worse and then it suddenly gets better. It's a one direction, it slowly progresses over time. 
and the diagnosis is usually from the clinical assessment and history. So uh, you're, you're diagnosing someone not based on imaging alone or from a blood test, but rather you're diagnosing them based on their symptoms that they present with. So what are the symptoms of dementia? Um, so Dr. Uh, Leung breaks it down into the ABCs. And so A is activities of daily living. So that's what we talked about before, driving, cooking. B is for behaviors. Now, behaviors do not occur in everyone. So some people will have it, some people may not have any behaviors. And so some of the common behaviors include paranoia, meaning being suspicious of other people. Uh, that can happen. So, you know, uh, occasionally we have people who are um, suspicious, that uh, somebody's stealing their money, but really it's just they're forgetting where they put their money. Um, so that can happen. And then uh, emotional ability, crying, tearfulness, being sad, being anxious, being upset, being angry. Uh, those are some behaviors that can happen with dementia. And the third thing, the C is for cognition, which is what we talked about, the memory, the language, etc. cetera. Uh, what are the types of dementia? So, so th this is again a little bit more complicated. We're not going to cover all of these types of dementias because uh, you know this is what people do for a full training program. But um, the most common is Alzheimer's disease, as I talked about before. And then you have vascular dementia, you have Lewy body, you have frontal temporal dementia. Um, frontal temporal is quite uncommon and usually happens at a younger age. Uh, memory is not a first problem. Lewy body is associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, it can happen, uh, but again, not the most common. The most common is Alzheimer's and vascular disease. Now, these two dementias can happen together, and we call that mixed dementia when they happen together. The um, most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, as I said before. And um, as I said, it's due to an abnormal accumulation of amyloid protein. Uh, it's more common as you get older. And the most, issue, the most common issue is short-term memory loss. There is no cure for it. But in terms of treating uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementias as a whole, the, the, the mainstay of treatment is, is to be supportive and to ensure safety. So, you know, we often think of diseases and we think, let's find a medication, right? let's find a drug for it. Well, in dementia, the drugs don't work really well. There's no drug that's curative. It doesn't cure the disease. Uh, it's very modest in effect, if any. But the most important thing that you can do is do for somebody with dementia is to ensure their safety, make sure that they're well supported in their home, uh, and uh, make sure their other medical issues are dealt with. And so this is why uh, having uh, a doctor going to see your doctor, like you know your family doctor, would know a little bit about this. And then if needed, they can refer you to a specialist, like, like a geriatrician, like myself, uh, who can help you um, address some of these issues. Um, some of the factors that will worsen uh, a dementia course includes cardiovascular issues, so stuff like blood pressure, high blood pressure, diabetes. These things will worsen dementia because they can lead to little strokes in the brain. And if you, your brain is already undergoing some sort of damage from the dementia, and then you, your blood pressure issue then kills off more brain cells, but well, then it's going to worsen your dementia. So you, you want to have the blood pressure controlled well, not too low, you know, especially people who are very old, if your blood pressure is too low, you're going to fall because you're going to pass out. Um, but you want it, you don't want it to be too high either. And then if you have diabetes, it's important. That's why your doctors are always after you about controlling your hemoglobin A1C or your sugar levels, because if your sugars are too high uh, for a long, long period of time, that can also cause damage to the brain. But remember that also low sugar hypoglycemia, low sugar, will also damage the brain. So it's important to work with your doctor or your diabetes specialist or uh, the diabetes nurse educator, whoever is on the team that, that's looking after you, to make sure that your diabetes is well controlled. Um, and he, being, being um, adherent to the diet, you know, do, 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 you know, doing that is good for your heart, but it's also good for your brain. Um, so remember that. Um, falling is a very common issue that happens as people get dementia. Uh, this talk is not about falls, but falls is one of the very common things that we deal with in geriatrics. If you fall, the issue is that you can injure yourself, you can fracture a hip, you can fracture another bone, you can fracture your spine, and then you can end up in hospital, you may need surgery. So that's why falls are dangerous because it can lead to consequences. Um, also, when people uh, develop more advanced dementia, when a dementia goes into late stage or end stage, uh, they may have aspiration, meaning that they may swallow things 
into their lungs, into the wrong pipe. Uh, and so that's a common occurrence and it, it uh, commonly leads to the ultimate issue, which is like pneumonia and death. So uh, aspiration, um, something that, that can be addressed, but uh, it's hard and it basically requires a caregiver to ensure that feeding is done, um, not you know, very quickly, but at a very good pace that the patient can swallow uh, a bolus of food and then go after another bolus. Um, then then of course, there are also other issues that may lead to a worsened aspiration. Um, so again, medications are, are modestly effective, but they have a lot of side effects, um, but they can help in some cases. I've noticed changes, what should I do? So um, early diagnosis is important. Uh, because um, it, it's not that you know, it, it's not that there's a lot we can do to change the overall course of the disease. Because dementia, once it starts, kind of takes its own course. But what we can do is make sure that there's nothing worsening it. You know, you don't want uh, to have dementia go faster than what it should go because you have other issues that need to be dealt with, like sleep apnea, like you know, uh, like your hypertension, your diabetes, or other other issues like B12, low B12, you know, stuff like that. So your doctors uh, and your healthcare providers uh, can be a good partner for this. They can ensure that you have good health and that all the preventative care is done. Um, you know, of course, in this time of COVID and pandemics, uh, every time somebody with dementia gets influenza or gets pneumonia, they can, it can actually worsen their dementia because you can have something called delirium uh, when you have an acute illness, and then that can worsen brain function. So it's important uh, to have good primary care. You know, get your flu vaccine, get your pneumonia vaccine, make sure that you don't end up in a situation where you get sick and end up in the hospital because of something that's preventable. Um, being actively involved in the care and choices. So if the diagnosis uh, gets happen, you know, it, it gets done early, uh, you may still be able to make decisions for yourself. You may be able to think, you know, what kind of things do I want or not want? Uh, if later in my dementia course, I'm unable to make decisions for myself, uh, you may be able to tell your family what kind of treatments you want or don't want. And so it's important to identify those choices early. Now, um, the third thing here is uh, more effective medication use. There are certain medications, as I said before, that can help with dementia, the most common one being Aricept or Dinepazil. That's the one that uh, you, know, you may have heard about. Um, it's one that we, we usually use as a first-line drug. They are associated with side effects, but you know, if we can get the disease early, then maybe we can start the medication and, and help um, sort of prevent uh, that the decline that's more quick than it should be. All right, and why seek care? So if you're worried about the possibility of dementia, it's important to see your doctor. And if you uh, don't feel like you're getting the help you need, you can be asked to be referred to a specialist, like a geriatrician, geriatric clinic, or a gain clinic. So um, th th this is important. Like basically, uh, if you're worried about memory, which a lot of people are, we see this all the time, definitely go see your doctor. Your doctors are able to uh, better tell whether something is normal or not and then you know if needed they'll refer you to a specialist like myself to to sort of help you uh, identify whether something's normal or abnormal uh, we see this all the time there are geriatric specialists and in, um, in a lot of places uh, in the gta where you guys may be calling from so um, there's a yeah they're basically the help is available but access is through your family doctor Uh, what can you do to protect the brain? I think I added this slide. Um, I get this question a lot, you know, what can I do to prevent dementia? So um, from a young age, you know, for, you know, if, if there's any uh, young people here, you have like children or grandchildren, education is, is very, very important. So from a young age, get good education, right? Stay in school, don't drop out of school. So if you have lower education, you're more likely to get dementia. And I get these questions like, you know, um, I know a lot of professors, you know, uh, you read the book Still Alice, you know, there's people who are well-educated and still end up getting dementia. Well, it, it's, it's a risk. It's not a definite thing. It's not that if you got two PhDs, you'd suddenly be immune from dementia. That's not true. But you would have a lower risk than somebody without those PhDs. It's a relative thing. It's relative to other people. 
Um, and in Still Alice, uh, that, uh, you know, that, um, I think it's a neuro psychologist, neurologist, uh, that, that professor uh, ended up uh, uh, having a mutation, a genetic mutation that predisposes to early onset uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Those mutations are uncommon. You know, most people who we see do not have those mutations, uh, but uh, it certainly makes for a traumatic story, a novel, and a movie. Um, but uh, the, the presentation is similar, but usually we see it in older age. Physical activity and exercise is important at any age, okay? So if you want to know what you can do to prevent dementia at any age, exercise, do your exercise. The doctors will say 30 minutes a day for five days a week. Do your exercise. It can be just walking, like it, it, it varies per person, but it, you know, walking is fine. Uh, if you're able to do more, you can do swimming. Now, swimming is a little hard because of COVID and the swimming pool situation. Um, but uh, you know, if you could do it, you know, Aquafit swimming is good for your body, for your brain health. Um, car aerobic exercises are good, uh, and some people, uh, if, under safe conditions, may do some resistance or uh, strength training exercises, that's also good. So, uh, you know, you can do a little bit of resistance training, a little bit of cardio, and that stuff is, is all good for your brain. What's good for your heart is good for your brain. Uh, eating a healthy diet. So um, this uh, is it more applicable to prevention of dementia. So uh, if you um, are especially in the middle ages and you have a chance to change your lifestyle and diet, it's a good idea, you know, don't smoke. Quit smoking if you're still smoking. The smoking will also worsen dementia. But as long with that, you know, eat healthy foods, Mediterranean diet, fresh fruits and vegetables, less red meat, uh, you know, less fats. Um, sorry, stay on the healthy, you know, grains and unsaturated fatty acids, salmon, olive oil, stuff like that. That stuff does have some evidence for prevention of dementia. Um, it's also good for your heart, so why not? Social interaction, that's important. Uh, is that this is that during the time of COVID, social interaction has been a, uh, almost a luxury because uh, if you live alone and during COVID, you may have been at home for months and months and months and not been out because of fear of getting the infection. Uh, certainly saw, uh, I've seen in clinic, just because we're doing virtual clinics, uh, a lot of older adults are, have been home for the last uh, five, six months. And it's, it's very hard on your body and your brain if you don't go out, if you don't have social interaction, um, it's not good for your brain. Uh, you have to talk to people, you have to be around people, um, then your mood will be better and then your, your memory, your cognition will also be better. So, you know, using creative alternatives, like, you know, using this a video conference, calling people uh, or hanging out with them when it's safe to do so. Like right now, if you have a mask on, you can certainly go out and meet some of your friends, uh, wash your hands and stuff like that. Um, manage blood pressure and diabetes. We've talked about this before, but if you have hypertension, high blood pressure or diabetes, make sure that those diseases are well managed. Um, uh, poor management of those diseases may worsen dementia. If you have hearing issues, it's time to get a hearing test done. Now, usually what happens is, you know, your family members will say that, well, you're having hearing issues because they're speaking very loudly and you can't hear. So if that's the case, definitely go see your family doctor or go to a hearing clinic. Uh, there's hearing clinics everywhere. Uh, they're usually uh, privately owned because they're for profit. Uh, but you typically, most clinics will not charge you for a hearing test. The way they make money is by you purchasing a hearing aid. Hearing aids are subsidized by the government, so they will pay uh, up to 50% of the cost with the assistive device program in the government of Ontario. Uh, certainly your audiology uh, center, your hearing test center can help you guide you through that. But even if you have hearing impairment and you don't want to, or you can't afford the hearing aid, there are lower cost alternatives that you can get uh, from Amazon, from Walmart. Uh, there's some over the ear um, amplifiers or some uh, hearing amplifiers called pocket talkers that you can use that are not like fitted and as discreet, but uh, they work just as well and they cost uh, between, you know, 120 to $150. And so um, there are basically there are ways around this issue, but getting a hearing aid is very important because if you can't hear well, uh, your brain will not do much, right? Because you need to be stimulated for your brain to actually work. And if you're not hearing anything, your brain's not gonna work very well. 
Uh, for those of you uh, who have depression, anxiety, mood issues, it's important to get those things treated with your family doctor uh, because that may also worsen mm -hmm. your cognition and your motivation to do things. Um, we also get this question a lot about what kind of cognitive activities will help you uh, um, prevent dementia, like, you know, uh, what kind of games or kind of like iPad games. Um, the, the literature is very inconsistent. The research on this is inconsistent. Uh, basically, if you learn a game, it's good when you're learning a game, when you're learning a new thing, it's good for your brain. But once you learn it, once you master it, playing the same game over and over again will not help your memory. It, it can help you like pass the time and you know activate your brain. But if you're doing the same activity over and over again, it doesn't actually make your brain learn something new. And what you need here is you actually need to learn something new. So I would say this, if you're playing a game with other people, socially, you know, a board game, mahjong, whatever you want to play, if it's with other people, that's good because there's a social part to it. You know, you, you get to engage with other people and, be, and socialize. That's going to be beneficial, um, spending time with others. But, you know, if you're on your iPad and you just play the same game over and over again, it may not be as helpful, but it's still better than, say, going to bed and sleeping for two hours, right? And we don't want you to sleep during the day because then you can't sleep at night and, and then you have more health issues. Um, these are some uh, more a reiteration of tips and tricks to maintain your memory. Uh, but, you know, for, for sure, like, you know, uh, get good sleep. I would say just get good sleep. Um, you know, don't drink too much caffeine, coffee, tea, so that you can sleep well at night. If you sleep well at night, you're going to be able to pay attention in the day, be more engaged and not take naps during the day. Uh, if you do that, then you'll again sleep better at night and you'll be more engaged during the day, which means your brain will have more chances to function. Um, when you're doing things, you know, engage the senses, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't just listen to music, for example. You know, listen to music is good, obviously, but, you know, you want to engage people, like go out, like talk to people, see people, see things, and you could involve all your senses. Um, uh, so for, for if you're having trouble learning complex things, focus on basic ideas. Um, if you uh, really need to remember something, it's good to use memory aids, like a calendar. Uh, or you can rehearse the information, sort of like repeat it in your brain, it can sometimes help retain information. Um, yeah, so those are the things that are helpful. Uh, okay, and then the last bit here uh, is about COVID and dementia. Not really news to everybody, so we all know that with the COVID pandemic, uh, as your age goes up, the, the uh, amount of people who, who die actually go up exponentially with age. It's uh, an unfortunate thing, but it it's a very common thing with respiratory diseases in older adults uh, because of changes to the immune system, to the lungs, to the body in general, something we call frailty. Uh, older adults are more susceptible to these infections. And so um, uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but um, during the pandemic, a lot of caregivers were not able to uh, be involved in caring for older adults, those with or without dementia. Um, I, you know, I do tell people, I have told my patients during this time that if you're a caregiver and your, you know, family member, the person you're looking after is dependent on you for care, uh, you're not optional, right? you're a necessity. So in that case, how do you do it? Because if you visit, won't you bring the COVID to, to an older adult? Well, of course you could, it's always a risk, but otherwise they'll be neglected and they won't get the care they need. So it's important for them to get care. And so, in terms of uh, caregivers and even older adults that are prevented, for sure wearing a mask is important. I think by this time, uh, everybody who is on this call here are health conscious and for sure all of you are wearing masks uh, when you go out uh, or when uh, you visit other people, for sure wearing a mask or face covering is very important. Um, uh, you know, for those who have access to a face shield, you can certainly use a face shield. These are the transparent, like the transparent uh, plastic shields that people strap onto their forehead and it covers their face. Uh, I do sometimes see people uh, wearing a face shield but not a mask. Um, you know, I think in some people with very severe uh, lung disease, maybe wearing a mask would be an issue. But for really almost everybody out there, wearing a mask should not be an issue to your breathing. Um, but, you know, I I've sometimes see young people just wearing a face shield. A like face shield is not a replacement for a mask. You have to use a mask. 
And uh, also wash your hands, um, you know, frequently with, uh, you know, if you see alcohol sanitizers in, in the places you go to in shops and in restaurants and malls, takeout places, definitely wash your hand going in, going out after you've touched stuff. And then uh, water and soap is also okay. Um, if you as the caregiver are sick, don't go visiting people. That goes without saying. But you know, if you are sick, especially if you have respiratory symptoms or other uh, infectious symptoms or fever, you know, don't go seeing older adults. You will you're going to subject them to illness. Um, and in the coming flu season, which is coming up very quickly, uh, for sure, everybody should get the flu vaccine. Um, there's some uh, data from the Southern Hemisphere saying that the flu season wasn't as severe. And it's probably because everybody was wearing a mask, washing their hands and staying inside. Uh, so that may be of benefit. But for sure, in Canada, at least the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada at the federal level, they're very worried about a flu pandemic. So like having a lot of people get influenza and have COVID later this fall and winter during the flu season because our hospital space will be overwhelmed. So it's important for us to do everything we can to prevent getting these infections. And for flu, there's a flu vaccine that will come up in a few weeks or a few months. Uh, for sure, we should all get the flu vaccine. Um, and for uh, the older adults here, who qualify for a shot of the pneumococcal pneumonia vaccines. If you have them already, that's very good. If you haven't had them, then for sure get your pneumovax. Uh, or if you have uh, coverage, you're willing to pay for it, get the Prevnar, which is uh, another form of the pneumonia vaccine that uh, is, uh, is effective. Um, and tips for caring for loved ones during uh, COVID with dementia, so maintain a routine, uh, find creative ways to exercise and stay active. So, uh, you know, the virtual technology is always helpful if you can set it up for them. Uh, an iPad, FaceTime, Zoom, Google Hangouts, whatever you have, right? Um, but uh, that, that's helpful. Uh, try to socialize, call people, and know your community resources for places you can go for extra support. Um, and of course, uh, for those who are older, who have more severe dementia it's important to think about what you want done if uh, you or your loved one got sicker especially with this disease and so uh, this involves something called goals of care or do not resuscitate um, better to be, dis be discussed with your healthcare provider but you know um, the question always is if you got sick and you got like not just like you know sick like a cold or anything but like you got really sick and you needed a ventilator or a machine to help sustain your life would you like to stay on that machine so um, these questions are more tricky and uh, for sure they're probably better discussed with your healthcare provider um, and uh, yeah, and the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, as well as the Alzheimer's Society of um, York Region, which is uh, Markham, where a lot of you may live in Peel Region, Mississauga, Brampton, or in Toronto, the Alzheimer's Society has a lot of information for um, people with dementia, family, caregivers, they're free of charge. Um, you could definitely go on their websites. They have a lot of information about the disease and the uh, care. They have phone numbers that you can call and really good. And of course, uh, this organization, uh, Care First for Seniors, uh, also a lot of resources that are available. The Care First website is excellent. It's uh, in uh, multiple languages, in Chinese and English. And so you can always go there for uh, help if needed. Uh, these are some takeaway points. I'm not going to bother reiterating them. I'm going to save the time for any questions. Uh, Ken, are you still there? Yep, I'm still there. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong, for the great talk. Um, so before I we go to open mic, there's just a couple of questions on the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, and the first question is from uh, Kai, but I think you asked that question early on, and then Dr. Wong covered that question already. So I'm right. just going to go on to the next question. Uh, the next question is from Didi. Uh, hold on, let me just go back up. Uh, so Dr. Wang, you mentioned the amyloid protein, uh, which damages the brain and causes dementia. How is that protein caused or formed? Is it from food? Oh, okay. So yeah, I mean, that's a common, you know, the, the, under, the protein is formed inside the body. It's not from food. Uh, there's no food that I know of that will worsen it or they'll make you accumulate the protein. It's, um, you know, if, if people knew that answer, the drug companies would be all over it. 
because all these drug companies all around the world are trying to target this protein. They spend billions and billions of dollars trying to target the amyloid protein and try to take it away, uh, but with very little success. It's, um, I think in terms of our understanding, we're still scientifically trying to understand the, the basics and the concepts behind it. Um, it's not only amyloid, uh, so it's not only amyloid, it's also something called tau, uh, which is also another abnormal protein. So um, it, it, it's basically, it's not related to food. It happens uh, naturally. Um, and, you know, they've also found that amyloid itself, like having amyloid in the brain, uh, will happen with age. So, you know, as people get older, it's more common. But even if you have amyloid in the brain, and you may not necessarily get dementia. So there's a very famous study in nuns in the United States where they did autopsies on, on, on all the nuns uh, as they got older. They volunteer for this, obviously. Um, and so uh, in, in that study, they found that it's not just amyloid that's important, but it's amyloid plus any strokes. So if you had any stroke, a little stroke that you may not even notice, that will greatly increase the risk of having dementia if you have the abnormal amyloid protein. So in terms of prevention, don't worry too much about the amyloid. Nobody can do anything about it. It's beyond our control. People don't even understand it that well yet, but do worry about strokes because that you can control. Control it by eating healthy, controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, not smoking, exercising frequently. Uh, these things you can do to prevent strokes. Okay, and then next question is from uh, Tomat, uh, and Chris, the question is, uh, does dementia progress to schizophrenia? Uh, good question. So, so, uh, so no. Um, the, the, schizophrenia and dementia are two separate diseases. I think I know what you're getting at is in people with schizophrenia, they have psychosis, which is the symptom of like either hallucinations, seeing people that are not real, seeing things that are not real, hearing voices, or delusions, meaning fixed false beliefs. And so people with dementia may get these. And remember, there was a slide about ABCs. B for behavior. Part of behaviors includes the paranoia, psychosis, hallucinations. These things can happen with dementia, but we don't call it schizophrenia because schizophrenia is a very different disease. But certainly uh, people with, with dementia can develop these behaviors. If you know somebody who has a dementia, develop these behaviors, for sure you should let your healthcare provider, you should let your family doctor, your geriatric specialist, your nurse practitioner, whoever's looking after you, you gotta let them know because there are medications to help with this symptom. Okay, and the next question is from Virginia uh, Graspi. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, what is brain food? I'm actually gonna unmute you, Virginia, if you wanna add to it, you can. Sorry, I just uh, gave you another uh, question, same thing. I said, don't bother to ask me, Dr. Wang just mentioned no such thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Okay, okay. so I'm gonna move on to the next one, uh, which is from Francis Chan. Um, can you advise uh, places to assess dementia for ages seniors? Uh, what kind of assessment uh, takes place during the process for early aware awareness? Okay, so um, so the uh, assessments can take place at your, you know, basically your family doctor's point that you would go into. Uh, there are some memory clinics in Ontario. I don't have the list on hand, but really your family doctor would be the point of access and they can refer you to the local gain clinic for geriatrics uh, or the local, um, you know, uh, memory clinics. Um, and um, what, what was the second part of that question, Kenneth? Uh, what is what kind of assessment takes place uh, oh, during yes. the process? Yeah, so um, the assessment involves um, mainly a history. So it's what we talked about here. They'll ask you questions about how you're living your life, activities that you're able to do that you're not able to do, uh, and they'll ask you about forgetfulness, like hallucinate the symptoms that we talked about, and then they'll do a cognitive test. They'll do a paper memory test, asking you stuff like you know, remember three words, remember five words, draw a clock, stuff like that. Uh, and then they'll do a physical examination. I hope they'll do a physical examination uh, and they'll do blood work investigations and possibly imaging of your brain, uh, MRI or CT scan. Okay, the next question is from Sonia. Uh, so what is the difference between Alzheimer and vascular dementia? Okay, so I just want to say here, Helen said here that CareFirst has a memory clinic on site. I think I'm obligated to say that. CareFirst has a memory clinic that you can go to. 
um, and Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. So um, uh, the difference is it's a different etiology. So vascular dementia happens because of strokes. The way vascular happens is because you have a stroke. It's either a big stroke or small stroke. Some strokes are silent. You don't even know it, but you can see it on the MRI scan. And so um, if the stroke kills off some blood cell or some brain cells, that will cause dementia. And uh, Alzheimer's disease is different. It's caused by amyloid, as we talked about before. These things can happen together. As I said, with the NUN study, if you have amyloid in the brain and then you have any stroke, any little stroke, it increases the risk of dementia a lot. Okay. And the next question from uh, Bridget, uh, being physically active, is there a difference in the brain activity if done if exercise is done in the morning or afternoon? Uh, good question. I, I, as far as I know, I don't think so. Um, it's important to be safe when you exercise, though. So uh, exercise when you're most comfortable doing so, when you're awake and when you're safe. You know, don't 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 fall. Be careful when you exercise. But uh, there should be no difference. Uh, next question from Clifford Lerm. Uh, what are the criteria to qualify for pneumonia vaccine? Uh, your family doctor will be better able to help you. I believe it's an age criteria. I think it's age over 65. And so um, for, and the government only funds the pneumovax uh, version of the vaccine for that age group. Uh, the Prevnar is is not funded unless you have some other issues. Um, but in general, it's a pneumovax and it's an age category, unless you have other comorbidities. And the next question from Addis Lam, uh, how harmful is alcohol to the brain? Uh, so uh, alcohol, so, uh, you know, it's hard. Okay, so I would say that, so alcohol is toxic to the brain, it is. So if you look at brain cells, give it alcohol, definitely not good for the brain. But, you know, people, some older adults have worked hard their entire lives and all they want to do is enjoy some time where they could have a, a drink of wine once in a while with dinner to enjoy. And that's fine. You know, we're not going to say like you cannot drink alcohol at all. What we're saying is don't drink excessively. Don't go drinking alcohol every single day. You know, don't go drinking like, you know, five, six beers a day. Like that's not good for your brain. It doesn't even matter what age you are. It's just not good for your whole body, for your health as, you know, as a whole. So if you drink it socially, rarely, in moderation, it's okay. But alcohol for sure is harmful to the brain. And so you know that because it causes you to, you know, go to sleep. And, you know, people can feel depressed after drinking alcohol. So, um, yeah, alcohol is, is, is not good for people with dementia. The next question is from uh, Joyce Tang. Uh, do melatonin or other intervention uh, make a difference to dementia? Um, melatonin doesn't, it doesn't make a difference to dementia, but it can be helpful for sleep. And so... Um, uh, melatonin, there's a separate issue called delirium, and there's some melatonin studies on it, but it's a separate issue. Melatonin should not be helpful for memory, but if it helps with your sleep and you cannot use another sleeping pill, uh, like Imovane or Ativan, you know, Lorazepam, Sofagol, there's some sleeping pills that are used frequently. Uh, those are not good for memory because they'll cause worsening of your memory, but melatonin is a relatively safe sleeping aid to use. You can get it over the counter. Low doses is fine. You don't need to use like 10, 20 milligrams of melatonin. Some people need it, but usually when you start like the lowest dose, like three milligrams, five milligrams is fine. Um, you should take it uh, maybe like 30 to 45 minutes before you go to sleep, dissolve it under the tongue or swallow it. Um, and there's also uh, some controlled release melatonin now that are dual layered. So there's a time release formulation. The reason they created this is because melatonin is relatively short acting. So it can help you fall asleep, but it may not help you stay asleep for the whole night. So um, if, you, if you get the control release version, there's like a quick dissolve outer tab and then there's inside, there's a time release inside version and so, uh, or inside part. And uh, if, you, if you take that, it can sustain eight hours of sleep essentially. The next question is from Victoria Bezella. Um, so the question is, in your slides, dementia versus not dementia, uh, why compare with ability record activity done five years ago? Uh, why this time frame? Oh, why five years? Oh, good question. I, okay, so it's, it's one of the things I do when I ask questions because 
you have to set like it, it does like five years arbitrary it's not five years it could be shorter it could be longer but i usually ask people what was your family member like five years ago 10 years ago or three years ago uh, because sometimes like change happens so gradually that you just don't notice you're like no i mean like it happens slowly over time but like think about what they were like five years ago which is like some you know it's good a good amount of time for change to develop and so usually people tell me well they were very different five years ago you know they were able to do their own thing they're able to walk and so change happened during the the, the prior five years um but they may be slow so if you ask them you know what were they like a year ago they may be like they're about the same a year ago but if it was five years ago it may be very different it's it's an arbitrary number that i use it's not scientific but i find that it's a good way to distinguish things that are happening on a slow scale over time uh, so we actually have a lot of questions, so I'll try to get through it. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so next question is Jenny Lai, can I apply for medically assisted death in advance if I am diagnosed with dementia? Oh, um, so, so as far as I know right now, the answer is no. Um, they are trying to challenge this in courts and are trying to provide um, a, an exception for this. But as it stands right now, the answer is no. You need to be able to consent to made uh, at the time uh, that you're ha undergoing that procedure, which would naturally exclude people with dementia. Now, there was a news article a couple, maybe last year in BC, uh, where uh, they actually uh, did made for somebody with it, what sounds like quite severe dementia. And uh, when I read it, and my colleagues were very sh surprised because I, I don't think they would be capable at that time, but anyway, they, they, you know, when this stuff, if you request it and a doctor does it, they get investigated by the college because it's not quite legally okay at this point. But sometime in the future, it may change. Uh, the next question is from Tara Ho. Uh, how often do you recommend an MRI? My mom did an MRI five years ago and determined that she has dementia. Uh, do you suggest her do another one? Good question. So uh, we, we don't, we don't really do that. Like we don't do interval scans very much. Uh, the MRI we do when you're diagnosed with the dementia, just for me to see what the, the cause is, right? Some people have issues like uh, strokes in their brain that they didn't know about. So the, oh, the only way to find out is by actually scanning the brain. But there's not much evidence for, for doing repeat scans. There's not much evidence for repeating the scan over and over again. Uh, it doesn't really tell you too much. It doesn't really help you make decisions. Uh, but what's more important is clinically how the patient's doing. Like, what are their abilities like? Are they developing incontinence? Are they developing issues with their bathing, with their toileting, with their dressing? So the clinical progression that are described on history is more useful than the scan image. Uh, the next question is from Isabel. How do you know if you have a silent stroke? That is a very good question. So by definition, you, you would not know unless you scan your brain. And so uh, yeah, that hence why it's silent. So these things are, are uh, they, they do happen. I wouldn't worry about it. Like if you have no issues, like absolutely fine. There's no, like you don't have to worry about it. Um, but obviously if you start having like memory problems, then we want to know why did you have a stroke at some point that we didn't know about uh, that we can uh, do something to prevent from happening again. So no, like silent strokes, you need, you need to scan your brain. Okay, um, the, I, right now I think I'm gonna open up the mic uh, just in case someone has trouble uh, typing a question. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask it out, but just be one at a time if possible. Okay, so I see uh, Mohini Bindra, you have uh, raised your hand. Okay, maybe. No, I didn't, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, that's okay, okay. that's okay. <laughs> Okay, in that case, I think we have uh, one, one more question from uh, Tomat. Uh, what kind of methods should we use to convince um, he or she who has exhibited dementia and seek doctor advice? Uh, sorry, so, so uh, that's a good question. Um, if, you know, if you know of a good technique, you should let me know because uh, that, that, that is a very tricky thing to do. Uh, I know that a lot of families struggle with this. Um, I mean, you can, 
I guess you can try to say like, you know, it's for your general health, it's for other issues. When you're seeing a geriatrician like myself, an older adult, a doctor for older adults, we don't just deal with dementia. Uh, sometimes there's some stigma around dementia and memory issues, it's okay. We see people for falls, for all sorts of other medical concerns. So for sure you can try to use that, you know, it's for your blood pressure, it's for your diabetes. It's okay for falls, for bone health. We do all that stuff. And then, but with it, you know, we're going to look at memory. So, um, you know, sometimes if you need to, uh, you know, conceal it a little bit, like that, that may have to be done. Um, usually it's good to talk to, like if you're going to do that and the, the doctor doesn't know what to expect, it may be a good idea to like tell the doctor in advance privately, either pull them aside or like give them a call in advance and say like, you know, the patient himself or herself are not aware that this is about cognition or memory. Um, I just don't to let you know. And then that way, when we approach the patient, we'll either do things separately, we'll either interview the family separate from the patient, which we often do, but not always, um, or we'll be more tactful and careful when we're doing this. Um, so that, yeah, a lot of people struggle with that, but the, the way to do it is to just to convince them to see a doctor for any other reason and then bring it up or like do a phone call or whatever, you know, try your best. Um, and Kenneth, uh, this is Catherine. I have a question on whether we, uh, the presentation material can be shared with us, uh, please. And thank you, Dr. Wong, for the good presentation and very informative and helpful. Uh, no problem. Um, no, yeah, no problem. I, I think uh, Ken, I think this is recorded, right? Yes, yeah, it is recorded. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's all there. Uh, I don't know. Like I don't know what uh, Dr. Long usually does with the slides, but I'm I'm fine. Like it's. It's all good. I, I'm happy to send. Um, how old do you have to be? So I'm just going to answer some of these sure. questions. Yes, here now. How old do you have to be to see a geriatrician? The answer is, um, in general, 65 years or above. There are some exceptions, but in general, 65 or above. What is a good way to prevent falls? That's a probably a different talk for falls, um, but. Uh, um, there's a lot of things you can do and it's it's multifactorial so uh, a medication review making sure that you're not on sleeping pills or under sedating medications uh, making sure that your gait and balance are good so you know doing exercises uh, making sure that using a walker you know if your doctor or if your doctor physiotherapist or your nurse says you need to use a walker or a cane please use a walker or a cane all the time because otherwise when you lose your balance you're going to fall uh, and then there are other things as well but they're more specific uh, and we'll need a more detailed presentation. Does taking omega-3 or D3 good for dementia? So uh, omega-3 and vitamin D are, are not specifically for dementia. They do not really help dementia. So, um, but they are uh, good for other reasons. So vitamin D3 is good for bone health. Um, we do recommend people take vitamin D for, for bone. So it's at least 1,000 units a day for all older adults in Canada, because half the time we're inside for the winter so we don't get enough vitamin d uh, and we need the vitamin d level for good bone health so vitamin d is good omega-3 um you know there's some evidence for heart protection i don't usually prescribe omega-3 but if people take it i don't stop it either you're allowed to you're allowed to take it if you want to it's not it's there's no evidence for dementia though these two things do not help with memory Good. No, I, so I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's uh, I think that's all the time we have today. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of Care First, uh, our CEO Helen and everyone here, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Wong, for coming. Dr. Wong, Dr. Wong, thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, doing the presentation for us. And uh, we are really privileged that Dr. Wong will be uh, one of our, um, the geriatricians uh, um, say like uh, seeing patients at our specialist clinic and even though now it's COVID-19 uh, we will be able to um, still um, say like uh, arrange with Dr. Wong if uh, say that among us the audience here this uh, uh, this afternoon say like if you do deem say like uh, your your parent or yourself would like to uh, somehow um, deem the need to see Dr. Wong uh, speak with us and also speak with your family physician to uh, to refer um, say like your 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 family member or friends I mean to the, our care first geriatric uh, consultation clinics so thank you once again thank you so much Dr. Wong for your precious time uh, doing the presentation for us thanks thanks a lot 
You're, you're very welcome. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for inviting me, Helen and Kenneth and Wen. Uh, thank you for all your organization. Uh, this is a great opportunity to see all of you here. Uh, great questions. Uh, thank you for your engagement and stay healthy, everyone. Thanks. Thanks thank again. Bye-bye.